Welcome, everyone, uh, to another Life and Breath Foundation educational webinar. Uh, my name is Saul Kachowskis. I'm a board member here at Life and Breath Foundation. Very happy to have you all here tonight. Uh, by popular request, the format tonight is a question and answer session with one of, our, one of our audience favorites, Dr. Richard Harris. Tonight's topic is supplements and sarcoidosis, question and answers. Uh, before we start, I have a few words about Life and Breath Foundation. Our primary goals are to offer the sarcoidosis community effective tools to track their journey, decipher medical issues, and maximize their quality of life. To provide nurturing environments to those affected by sarcoidosis, to share their experiences, build more awareness within the medical community, and to help combat this chronic disease. Also, I'd like to remember uh, for everybody, the sarcoidosis uh, is big in April. It's uh, Sarcoidosis Awareness Month, and Life and Breath Foundation will be hosting our virtual 5K run and one mile walk starting this weekend, April 16th through the 24th. Uh, for more information, please check our website, lifeandbreath.org. Okay, also please remember to use the Q&A function for your questions uh, during the session. Okay, our speaker tonight is Dr. Richard Harris. Dr. Harris is a regular speaker presenter and very popular here with Life and Breath Foundation uh, webinar series. Dr. Harris is a pharmacist and a holistic practitioner he knows that striving for great health and wellness is crucial to living a higher quality of life. As a successful internal medicine physician and pharmacist, Dr. Harris has the critical expertise to help you achieve your best health. This double doc received his doctor of pharmacy from University of Texas at Austin, the Hook and Horns uh, University, and his medical degree from McGovern School of Medicine. Following his residency at UTMB, Dr. Harris worked for a large practice in Houston, but ultimately left to pursue his goal of promoting holistic lifestyle medicine. Dr. Harris is also CEO of Great Health and Wellness. The process at Great Health and Wellness is different from most conventional medicine practices. They only offer services online, focusing on lifestyle medicine, precision, supplementation, and gut health. Their goal is not to replace the primary care provider, but to augment and bolster what they do to keep you healthy. The essence of what great health and wellness does is distilled into simple, three simple processes, knowledge, plan, and action. For more information, please visit Dr. Harris's website at bghwellness.com. Again, uh, for the question and answer format, just please uh, ask your questions in the section that says Q&A. Dr. Harris, thank you very much for being here tonight. The stage is yours. Take it away. All right. Thank you so much for having me, guys. I always like to start off by, first off, thanking my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, for allowing me to come and speak with you guys today. And also to thank each and every one of you for showing up on this fine evening. I just briefly want to start before we take questions with the notion of supplements because, and, you know, don't hate me for this, but a lot of people look for quick fixes and they think if I just get the right supplement, the right this, the right that, the right quick thing, it's going to solve all my problems. And it's not supplements are literally that it is a supplement. The whole concept of supplements came from um, when people would eat certain nutrition plans, companies made these supplements because they thought that, well, you know, for vegans, they're going to miss out on certain nutrients like iron, like zinc, like creatine, like carnitine, which are mainly from meat sources. And so we need to get people supplements to get things that are missing in their nutrition plan. And then it boomed into the billion dollar industry that it is now. And I'm a huge believer in supplements. I love supplements. I think they can do some amazing things, but the supplements, just like medications are not 
going to solve your issues if you have bad lifestyle habits. Lifestyle medicine, as we've talked about before, is the most important aspect of your health. Nutrition, um, stress management, sleep, toxin avoidance, all the things that we talk about in lifestyle medicine, connection, right? Those, those are all the really key drivers of health. And then using targeted supplementation on top of that. Now, the other thing about supplements is you have to make sure you're taking quality supplements. And how do you tell if you have a quality supplement? Because you can't just tell by price alone. There's a couple different things here. And I have my own supplement company. I use high-end supplements. I consult for several supplement companies. So I'm pretty in-depth in the supplement industry. And there are ways that you can tell if people's products are legit or not. Number one, what certifications do they have? You want to look for things that say GMP, NSF, USP. These are all acronyms that mean different things. But NSF is in USP or organizations that do third-party independent testing of products. And so when you see this on a label, that means the company is so assured of their product that they're paying somebody else to test their products to make sure, number one, it has what it says it has in it. It's not contaminated with heavy metals. It doesn't have um, other ingredients. There's a huge problem in the supplement industry where they, their hidden ingredients are put in things. And you know, a lot of people think the supplement industry is not regulated. It is regulated, but the FDA is not big enough to go in and inspect every single supplement company. They just can't do it. They can't even get to all of the drug companies where they're manufactured. Uh, this is why we're having so many adulterated drugs. If you've been wondering why you're seeing all these drug recalls for benzene and other contaminants, it's because there's not enough international inspectors to go to all the plants. And so what happens? They start cutting corners and you know that's, that's uh, what happens. You get uh, adulterated or products or products that aren't safe. So Make sure that it says one of those things. Another thing is look at the language that they say on the website. Companies that really are about safety, are about quality, that's their language. It's all in their marketing. That's what they go because they're not going to market to you about, you know, oh, our products are 100% guaranteed to do this or that or whatever. They're going to tell you that we really pride ourselves on getting the safest, most effective supplements. We pride ourselves on our sourcing Sourcing is very important where the supplements come from. We pride ourselves on testing. When do they test? Do they test before they get the ingredients? Do they test when they have the ingredients? Do they test before the supplements go out? Do they test after, you know, to testing the shelf life of these, of these supplements? So that's important. And so you'll see these things also on their websites. You'll see like CGMP or FDA inspected or USP or, um, other, those are the big ones that you'll see, you know, some of the ways that you can tell the facilities are top notch is they'll put that they have ISO certifications. That's actually a governing board that, that looks at manufacturing of, of chemicals and things like that, and has a high standards in the manufacturing process. That's also what GMP means. And that's to make sure that things are manufactured in a way that they're not that that's best practices, right? So those are the things that I think are very important for the supplements that you take. The number one thing is make sure they're quality, go to their website, make sure you're looking at, at what they say, what they're saying, what they're about section. Do they have these certifications there? Make sure that they don't have proprietary blends. I typically hate proprietary blends because you're, you're probably getting ripped off. And the reason for that is they'll put a lot of the cheap ingredients and a little of the expensive ingredients. So one of the things yeah, that with the supplement companies that I use, we use doses that have been clinically studied. And that's important because if something could say it has turmeric in it, but if it's 10 milligrams of turmeric and the studies are 200 milligrams of turmeric, then you're not going to get the effect that you're looking for. So that is something that is, is very important as well. Staying away from those proprietary blends when possible, because that's just a way to hide the expensive ingredients and, and up 
increase the cheap ingredients to increase their profit margin because there's no proprietary anything in this industry, right? That all this info research is public. So if you see a study that says, you know, 200 milligrams of quercetin does this, well, everybody knows that. So the amount that's in the supplements, it shouldn't be proprietary. It should be, oh, we're using quercetin. Okay, we're using 200 milligrams. So that's another thing that's important. And then finally, like I mentioned before, lifestyle, again, you, you cannot overcome lifestyle problems with supplements or medications. I don't, I don't care what it is, even like peptide therapy and some of the most advanced medical techniques on the planet. I talk to people doing these things. They log data saying they're far more effective in people who are doing the, the things right, their nutrition plan, their exercise, your stress management, their sleep, their mindfulness, all of these other things, and that boosts the effect of the supplements. So that's just kind of our, our, our overview there. Uh, I see we've got a, a couple questions here that, uh, that we can answer. Actually, let me, can I start, uh, Dr. Harris? I have a question yeah. that's pertinent to what you just mentioned. They said, how would I determine dosage for the various supplements on the market? And it says, aren't all supplements toxic at a certain dosage? Um, so yes, there's a toxic dosage for everything. There's a toxic dosage for water. It's just really, really high, right? But you can literally drink yourself to death with water. It just takes a lot of water. But determining the dosage, so there are things that you can look at. You can look at clinical trials. You can look at PubMed or um, clinicaltrials.gov. There are resources that you can look at. There are websites like Natural Medicines Database. Uh, Examine.com is a really good one that you can look at that, that will go into details about human and animal studies related to certain products to look at the dosing. So those are the resources that you can go to to see. And then... Yeah, so that's why I'm very careful about the proprietary blends thing, because if you don't know the dosage, you don't know how much you're getting is if you're getting a, a safe or effective dose. And so stick with things where are they're clearly identified on the label. Now, you could also talk to a pharmacist or a naturopath or somebody like that because those are the type of people who are going to have a little bit more information about the dosing, but you can also do your own research, look up clinical papers. You can easily type in, let's say, quercetin dose for allergies, and you can find clinical papers online that list what those doses are and then go from there. You know, you have to put on your own research coat, right? No, your health is your own responsibility. It's not my responsibility. It's not... Um, you know, your doctor's responsibility, it's your responsibility to take your health into your hands. So there are tons of resources available to do your own research, but those are some of the ones that I recommend. Okay, Dr. Harris, uh, are there certain brands you recommend for supplements? Yeah, so most of these are only available through providers. So I tell people you can go to holistic pharmacies, um, compounding pharmacies typically stock this, Functional medicine doctors, integrative medicine doctors typically carry these lines of supplements, but uh, orthomolecular, and this is in no particular order. I don't have any financial relationships with these supplement companies. Um, orthomolecular, pure encapsulations, thorn is another really good one. Uh, if you're into plant-based uh, herbals, uh, Gaia herbs is a good one. I am an advisor for Gaia herbs. So those are the ones that um, you know, typically orthomolecular and pure encapsulations are the ones I use in my house, but you can't just go online and order those, but going to one of those sources I mentioned is where you can find supplements like that. But again, there are other ones out there. Just look for those labels, USP, NSF, um, FDA inspected CGMP. Those are, those are the, the things that you know that that company does third-party testing and it's probably a better supplement company. Sounds great. Thank you very much. Um, is there a certain time of day I should or shouldn't take certain supplements? Yeah. And that varies by supplement. I, I you know, it's like caffeine, for instance, the caffeine has a lot of beneficial health effects, 
Uh, there's lots of studies coming out showing that caffeine intake lowers like cardiovascular mortality and there's a benefit in like um, neurodegenerative diseases with, with caffeine, but you don't want to take caffeine after 3 p.m. because uh, 2 to 3 p.m. because it has a it stays in the body for six hours. And most people, some people, it's a little bit longer. Some people, it's a little bit less. So, you know, if you've still got caffeine running around your system at nine or 10 o'clock at night, you're going to have trouble sleeping. The other thing is you don't want to take too much of it, right? Because, you know, I take no more than 200 milligrams a day because it can put tax on your, on your nervous system. It's much more important to get good sleep. So it just varies by the supplement as far as time of day. The other question I get asked is about food. And there are certain supplements that do better with food. There are certain supplements that do better without food. For instance, iron. Iron is much better absorbed with vitamin C and no food. So, you know, that's why you'll see the good products have some vitamin C with the iron to help it absorb. But a lot of times people can't take supplements on an empty stomach. It upsets their stomach. Most um, supplements I tell people take with food. The reason for that is it gets digested inside the food. And so your body knows what to do with nutrients from food better than nutrients that don't exist inside of food because there are cofactors that go along with that. And then, you know, the fat soluble vitamins, A, D, E, and K only get absorbed with fat. So they, they, if you're taking your vitamin D on an empty stomach, it's not doing anything for you. You're not absorbing much of it. So that's why I, typically I tell people take them with food and then the time of day, it just varies based upon the supplement and your intention. Again, this is something you can speak with your pharmacist or your holistic provider about getting that correct. Uh, what are your thoughts on melatonin for sleep? I have trouble calming down before sleep. Yeah, so melatonin can be useful for short term. I don't like using melatonin long term because it's a hormone. So if you take melatonin chronically, it shuts down your body's own melatonin production. The other thing about melatonin is in kids, the reason kids don't go through puberty is because they have high melatonin levels. That's why they tend to sleep later and, and stay up later because their circadian rhythms are shifted because of the higher baseline melatonin levels. Now, once the melatonin starts to drop towards adult levels, they go through puberty. The reason I mention that is taking too much melatonin can impair your, um, your sex hormones. So that's another reason. Melatonin also, for the most part, is most useful when you're using it um, to switch something. Like if you're switching between night shift and day shift, or if you're traveling and you've got some circadian rhythm disruption, the best things you can actually do for sleep are number one, uh, limit that caffeine intake, exercise early in the morning, that will improve your sleep, get sunlight, about two to 10 minutes of sunlight to your eyes before 10 a.m. And then again, around dusk, it kind of primes your body, it sets your circadian clock in the morning. And then when you get it at dusk, it prevents a light sens sensitivity at night. Another thing that you can do is when the sun goes down, turn off the overhead lights, turn on lamps, because our bodies, the way our, 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 our light sensing cells in our eyes work is they look for light overhead. If they see light overhead, it tells us to wake up. So that's another thing you can do. Another thing you can do is cool your body down before you go to sleep, because your body temperature drops when you go to sleep. It's, it's one of the ways your body tells all the cells in the body it's nighttime. So a cool shower can help before going to sleep. And then finally, um, you can use things like chamomile, lavender, those can help uh, meditation. If you have problems calming down, do like non-sleep deep rest protocol or meditation protocol about 30 minutes before you want to go to sleep and you will sleep fantastic. Great, thank you. Uh, are there any specific supplements for pulmonary sarcoidosis that you would recommend? Yes. Yeah, so if you look at the literature on supplements and sarcoidosis, if last time I looked, there's only two supplements that are mentioned, vitamin D and quercetin. Those are the only ones that I found that actually have trials on them. There are other ones that people think mechanistically that can help, right? So let's talk about quercetin. Quercetin is a very, very powerful antioxidant. It's found in things like onions. It's found in um, like apples, those types of foods. Um, 
it, green tea. So quercetin is a really strong antioxidant. There is some data showing that, that quercetin can help in sarcoidosis. The reason is there's studies showing that in sarcoid, you have a deficiency of antioxidants because it's an inflammatory disease, right? And so your antioxidant, what we call total antioxidant capacity gets used up. So antioxidants are something that people thought were beneficial and they looked at quercetin because it's one of the strongest. And that study did show benefit. I think the dosing in that was 500 milligrams twice a day. Um, I not hundred percent sure off the top of my head, but that's kind of the usual dosing you see with quercetin is 250 to 500 milligrams once or twice a day. The other is vitamin D and vitamin D is kind of tough because sarcoid, you can have increased vitamin D levels. So vitamin D is made in our bodies from sun UV actually hitting our skin. We take cholesterol, we turn it into a vitamin D precursor that goes to our liver. And then our liver turns that into a kind of a pre vitamin D. And then that circulates to our kidneys where it gets activated into what we call the 125 version of vitamin D, which is the active version of vitamin D. Now the enzyme that activates that final version it's also present in the granulomas that you get with sarcoid. And so one of the reasons why people tell you don't take vitamin D with sarcoidosis is because you can actually have very high levels of that activated version of vitamin D. But what you don't want is actually a vitamin D deficiency. It can be a little tricky to tell in sarcoid. So how do you do that? You need to measure calcium levels. You need to measure the 125 vitamin D and the 25 vitamin D. Most of the time when we measure vitamin D, we're measuring the 25. And what you'll see in people who have high levels of the active version, they have a low 25 and a high 125, meaning that vitamin D is being, is being kicked over at an increased rate to that active version. And typically you'll see people in this scenario will have an elevated calcium They'll also have a suppressed PTH. But before going on any type of vitamin D supplementation with sarcoidosis, you have to check the both vitamin D versions, your calcium, your kidney function, and your PTH level. And you have to integrate all of that information in to decide what dose to take. And then you want to keep doses less than 1,000 um, international units a day. Thank you. Do you think glutamine helps leaky gut? I'm worried I have leaky gut from years of taking too many antibiotics. Yeah, absolutely. Glutamine is, is fantastic. I take five grams of glutamine a day. Uh, I have irritable bowel, but I also take it as a in part of my pre-workout solution because glutamine is a very strong stimulator for muscle protein synthesis. Muscle is the currency of health. If you want to be healthy, get more muscle mass. That doesn't mean you have to get bodybuilder big but you want to get as much lean muscle as possible. That is a very healthy state to be in. So glutamine, why this is important is our gut cells love glutamine. They use it for energy. It's very, very important for signaling in the gut. So it's something that we'll use as part of our, our leaky gut protocols. It can be anywhere from five to 15 milligrams uh, split you know, so five milligrams, three times a day for a little bit for leaky gut. One of the best things that you can do for leaky gut is actually bone broth because bone broth contains glutamine. It contains glycine. It contains other amino acids that are part of collagen. And that is important to helping heal the, what we call tight junctions. They're the, the spots in between the cells in our gut that causes leaky gut. So um, I, I'll, I'll do that as part of, of a healing process for people who have leaky gut. Uh, do you recommend a multivitamin? Um, if so, uh, which, uh, which vitamins do you recommend? And uh, well, let me get, uh, I worry about taking too many supplements, but also want to make sure I'm getting the vitamins I need. Yeah. So number one, if you're worried about taking too many supplements, go to an integrative or functional medicine doctor and get something called a Nutra eval done. The Nutra eval will look at exactly like what you need metabolically from a vitamin and mineral perspective. It is an incredible test. Uh, off insurance is $400.
That's it. If they're charging you more than that, they're marking the test up. So um, that's what the actual cost as a provider is. And it tells you a host of information about your vitamin and mineral status. Now, a multivitamin, my favorite multivitamin is called One by Pure Encapsulations. It is a great multivitamin. That's typically what I recommend to people. That's typically what we use in all my companies. Uh, another one, and I'm an advisor for this company, it's called Routine, R-O-O-T-I-N-E. What Routine does is it looks at um, multiple different genes, like 52 genes, and it looks at 80 different blood metabolites to check and, and make a custom, com a custom supplement just for you based upon your genetics and your metabolism. And, and that's, a, that's a really cool concept because that's personalized medicine. That's the future of medicine. That's where we're heading. And there are companies like Routine that does that. Uh, Paragon is another company that does that. And there's a third one I can't remember the name of. So those would be kind of my, my suggestions there in regards to what multivitamin I typically recommend. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question. I have sarcoidosis and third stage kidney and liver disease and gastroparesis. However, I have need of supplements to keep my hair from thinning. It's all too much to take in sometimes. What would you, uh, what do you think? Yeah, I, you know, I'm sorry to hear about all those issues. Uh, my mom has gastroparesis and that's devastating for, for people because it, it can impact that. Um, so this is, this is a tough question for me to answer because there's a lot of, of disease processes going on here. And so the best thing that you can do is test. When you have a lot of those issues going on, test, 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 test to see what your body is actually deficient in. And, and that can guide you to what supplements that, that you need for, um, for those, for those issues. You know, there's some things that I could just ballpark recommend, but I, I think that would be doing you a disservice because they could end up doing more harm than good because a lot of these things go through the kidneys. And then there's some things you have to be careful of, like excess protein intake and things like that when you actually have kidney disease. So in that scenario, if you came to me as, a, as a, when I had my clinic, what I would do is test you, see exactly what you're deficient in. And then start really low doses on something, uh, probably choose something liquid, a uh, liquid in your, in your case, because that's going to be easier to absorb. Or I would go to directly to IV or, or intramuscular therapy. Um, IV therapy, if we found something that you were very deficient in, but you have to be careful with that with kidney disease because of volume, right? Uh, IM therapy, injecting it in the muscle because that gives a very slow release of things. So those are things that I would I would do. I would probably try to bypass oral absorption as much as possible and then try to do um, some of these other amounts using low doses at first, but only what your body actually needed by testing first. Great, thank you. Uh, do any supplements interact with prednisone? Yes. So pregnancy, anything that would dampen your immune system in high doses that can interact with, with prednisone. So some of the, the anti-inflammatory stuff that people typically take like turmeric and resveratrol and things like that while you're on the prednisone. Now, the other flip side of that is prednisone can deplete several uh, nutrients. Uh, I actually have a friend whose business is she consults with people who are on chronic prednisone to help guide them through the uh, nutrient deficiencies that happen with, with prednisone. But this, the, the things that can happen, you can get loss of vitamin K, vitamin C, uh, selenium, zinc, uh, B vitamins, uh, potassium, magnesium can get depleted, um, vitamin A, vitamin C, uh, chromium, you can get uh, sodium wasting. So there's a lot of these issues that can go on. Again, the best thing that you can do is test to see exactly what your body is deficient in and then go from there. Thank you. Since being told to take folic acid and other supplements, it appears my fiance is breaking out in rashes more often and more severe. 
Uh, she's had two trips to the ER in the last month for steroids. Could it be from too many supplements? It's possible, and it could be the quality of your supplements. So like I talked about before, um, when you start supplements, I should have mentioned this. When you start supplements, start them typically one at a time. So if I have people who have very sensitive disease states like sarcoidosis, I will typically pick single ingredient herbal supplements. So like vitamins and minerals, I'm less concerned about because they're present in the body, right? I'm not introducing something that is foreign to your body's ecology. They're just, they're there, you know, zinc, magnesium, B vitamins. Those are stuff that are, uh, you know, some of that our body can't make, but they're in our routine, we've needed them for thousands of years, right? Now you start adding in herbals, ashwagandha and turmeric and holy basil and all that stuff. That's when things can get a little wonky. And so in that regard, what I'll do is I'll, I'll, I'll recommend a single supplement. So if you're going to add in like quercetin, you just do quercetin at first. Don't try combination products because if it's a combination product, you don't know which one you might have a reaction to. Use it for two to three weeks and then, okay, if you want to add something else, add something else. In general, if I'm making supplement recommendations, I try to limit it to two to three supplements because a lot of them work through the same pathways. And then working with someone like me, um, we can guide you through what's the best targets for this type of thing. So that's, that's in my regard. So first off, what I do is I would just stop everything. I would check to see like what's the quality of these supplements you're taking because cheap supplements use filler products that can cause allergic reactions. My favorite uh, company for people who have these type of allergic reactions is Pure Encapsulations. They make hypoallergenic supplements. That's like their thing. That's like their claim to fame. Uh, and why they're popular is a lot of people will use them for their clients and their patients who uh, have a lot of allergies. Thank you. Are there supplements or probiotics to help with the feeling of fullness? Can only eat small amounts and then I'm full. I uh, have liver sarcoidosis. Um, so probiotics in that scenario may or may not help. And the reason I say that is um, there could be an underlying dysbiosis, abnormal gut bacteria, and it, sometimes probiotics can make that worse. So in, the, in, in that scenario, I typically wouldn't start on, with probiotics. I would start, in general, I don't start with probiotics. I start with fermented foods. There was a study recently that, that came out that looked at um, the, the microbiome and compared like probiotics with uh, fermented food intake or, or for a probiotic, they compared uh, fiber intake with fermented food intake and found that the fermented food intake was associated with better microbiome status than, than uh, high fiber intake. And so these fermented foods like kimchi, kombucha, sauerkraut um, have a lot of wonderful healing properties for the gut. Again, then, like I said, bone broth earlier is one of my favorite gut things. So in general, this is probably due to local inflammation, maybe a local mass effect, meaning that there's a, the, the sarcoid granulomas there in the liver and it's compressing on things. Um, I would functionally treat this like a hiatal hernia. Uh, number one, eat small meals, you know, know your limit, right? If you know you can only eat a certain amount, don't exceed that. Eat what you can eat. Uh, and people like this who have these issues, I say it may be more beneficial to in, add liquid calories. Typically, I don't recommend liquid calories. But if we have issues here, then um, appropriate juicing where you know you're adding protein and, and fat to the juice may help because that's bypassing that distension of the stomach. The other thing that, you, you know, is important is don't stay seated after eating, right? Don't eat and then lay down, take a walk after you eat. Um, don't drink liquids while you eat because that just further expands that space. So those are some of the things that, that I would recommend. Uh, Dr. Harris, what supplements are good for extreme fatigue? Sleep is the most important thing. Sleep and exercise. And I know people uh, that may sound like insensitive, but prioritizing high quality sleep is very important. 
um, getting in some type of exercise, whatever you can do, whatever, even if it's forcing yourself to go walk outside for two minutes, sunlight is very important for fatigue, very important for energy generation. Now, in general, the, the things that can be used are creatine. Uh, if you don't have kidney issues, creatine actually helps our body generate more energy. So whenever I see someone who has a lot of fatigue, I think it's either inflammatory, hormonal, or metabolic, right? So I would work up the inflammatory, I'd work up the metabolic pathway um, and the hormonal pathway and see what's the underlying cause and then address it. Sometimes caffeine can be good, but too much caffeine can actually send you the other way and make you fatigue. So I have people, you know, came to me drinking 600 milligrams of caffeine a day and like, I'm always tired. I'm like, you're drinking too much caffeine, cut it back and you'll see yourself improve. Uh, you know, meditation, non-sleep deep rest is good for that. And then I look at things that, that actually improve metabolism, things like coenzyme Q10, things like uh, EGCG, um, B vitamins, because they're all actually helping the body turn food into energy. And then the most important thing I've said, people, when they have a lot of fatigue, ask, what are you eating? Because if you're eating a lot of processed food, a lot of fast food, if you're eating a lot of carbohydrates, not getting enough protein, not getting enough good fats, if you're eating too much at one meal, that's all going to make you tired. So in reality, the, most of the supplements that help with energy are stimulants. That's something that you want to avoid. You want to address the root cause of what's causing the fatigue. And then if I'm doing things, I'm going to put people on things that are actually going to help the mitochondria make energy, like the things I mentioned. Uh, alpha lipoic acid is another one. Uh, coenzyme Q10, N-acetylcysteine. These are all things that are very important in actual energy generation and mitochondrial function. And that's typically how I approach fatigue. Uh, Dr. Harris, uh, are there any top foods you recommend for patients with sarcoid? I'm so worried about taking too many medications and too many supplements. Is there, is there a food that you would recommend? There's a way of eating. You want to eat a very low inflammatory type nutrition plan. And luckily, we if you haven't watched it, our colleague, Dr. Benote, has a wonderful webinar. I believe, um, Abby, that's on our, our YouTube page where she talks about nutritional strategies for inflammation. So that is the webinar that I would go to. In general, the most important thing about nutrition is eat whole foods. If you could take anything away from this, you know, I don't care about keto, carnivore, vegan, Mediterranean, whatever. The most important thing is eat whole foods, single ingredient foods. If you get 90% of your nutrition from single ingredient whole foods, you will see dramatic improvements in your health. I guarantee it. The number one problem with most Americans is that we consume too many calories and we consume garbage calories. You cut back on the garbage calories, increase the, the nutrient dense calories and watch your overall calorie intake drop. So I, I'll refer you to Dr. Bonote's uh, webinar. She did a great webinar related to your exact question. Great, thank you. Uh, my doctor doesn't think I, sh I should take any supplements and doesn't think changing my diet will help anything. I feel lost. What type of specialist or physician can I go to who will help me? I feel like my doctor only wants me to take prednisone. Um, you know, I'm sitting here shaking my head and looking down because I'm, I'm furious right now. I, I, I get so pissed off that there's so many doctors out there and I know it's not their fault. We don't get taught nutrition in medical school, but it is their fault for staying ignorant. Nutrition is the most important thing by far. If you, let, let's just say you're a manufacturer, right? And you make wood furniture and you find a rotted log on the side of the road. Is that going to make good furniture? No. Now let's say you find a beautiful piece of mahogany wood. Is that going to make good high quality furniture? Yes. The quality of your raw materials matter. Our body is literally made from the stuff that we intake. I mean, we don't just appear out of thin air. You know, no magician snaps his fingers and then a human being is created. We literally recreate ourselves all the time from the raw materials that you put in your body. And so it's absolutely insane that people still think that uh, a quarter pounder and a side of fries and a big gulp from McDonald's 
is going to build the same quality of proteins and, and, and body structures as eggs, a grass-fed steak, broccoli, nuts, blueberries, all these other things. So that's the number one. Number two, the supplements can be very effective when used correctly. And again, test. Um, the type of doctor that you want to see is find an integrative or functional medicine doctor in your field. Find a functional nutritionist. They um, have a lot of nutrition knowledge, but they also have a lot of lifestyle knowledge. Find a health coach because health coaches understand a lot about lifestyle medicine. Lifestyle medicine is the most important aspect of medicine by far. It's not supplements. It's not medications. It is your lifestyle. So that's where I would start and then do the appropriate testing to see what two or three supplements I think you could get the most uh, benefit from. Thank you. Uh, I have sarcoidosis. I've had hypercalcemia in the past. I am on steroids. I'm over 50 year old female. Can I take vitamin D or calcium eventually? Possibly. Again, it, it, it just depends on those labs, right? You, you have to check the labs. You have to check the calcium. You have to check your 125 vitamin D and your 25 vitamin D. You have to check your kidney function and you have to check your parathyroid hormone level. And you have to look at all of those together and then come up with a conclusion. But you also need a doctor who understands that entire pathway. And then once you understand that pathway, then you can say it's safe or it's not safe to take vitamin D3. Because if, you're, if your 125 D3 is high or normal, I don't care your 25 OH is low because you're, you're, and then your calcium is normal and your PTH is normal. You have enough vitamin D, even though your 25 is low, the active version is normal. So that's the things that you have to look at. So I can't blanket say, you know, vitamin D is, is safe, right? Um, again, uh, lower doses, if you have sarcoidosis, you know, 400 to a thousand international units in that range is what I would do if someone had good biomarkers, right? Uh, and those, those labs I just mentioned, and then I would check, I would monitor them. I'd bring them back in a month, bring them back in three months, then bring them back in six months if everything was normal, just to monitor those biomarkers and see. Thank you. Uh, this is about collagen. If with nephrocalcinosis, uh, calcin where kidneys are impacted by prednisone, is it a good idea to add collagen to the diet? Um, it could be. It just depends on how much protein intake you have. So there's, there's a lot of controversy over protein and kidney issues. If you are healthy and you have no kidney issues, having excess protein is not bad for you. The problem is, is that if you have kidney disease, like stage three, four, five kidney disease, and you get um, higher amounts of protein, it can accelerate kidney function decline. But there's actually a recent uh, systemic review, which is aggregating the data, and it didn't show that there was any impact to overall mortality, meaning death rate. So what happened was people in the who already had pre-existing kidney dysfunction, who had high protein intake, the kidneys function worse and faster, but it didn't lead to any increase in death. So it's one of those things that, again, could you add collagen could, and, and be okay? Yes, but you want to make sure that you're already not, that you're not getting excess protein from adding collagen. And again, let me be very clear, this is in people who have a kidney disease already. If you do not have kidney disease, then protein intake is not worrisome for kidney function. Thank you. Uh, does sarcoid in general deplete or make those of us afflicted with sarcoid to become deficient of any essential vitamins or minerals our body needs? Yeah. So earlier I mentioned that there's a, there's a study showing that people with sarcoid have a generally lower total antioxidant capacity. This is basically a test that looks at how well your body's able to scavenge or clean up something called free radicals. When we turn food into energy, we generate some pretty toxic byproducts, and these byproducts can attack 
DNA and proteins and other structures. This is called oxidative stress. So when, when you have uh, what we call ROS or reactive oxygen species, when you have a decreased antioxidant capacity, it means that your body is not is 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 too deficient in these antioxidants to clean up all the the mess left by metabolism and inflammation. So you can see a depletion in antioxidants. So antioxidants like vitamin C, vitamin E, uh, quercetin. Um, you can see changes in zinc and magnesium levels. Magnesium is very important. You know, somewhere between 40 to 60% of people in America don't get enough magnesium. And when your body's under stress, uh, you start hemorrhaging magnesium out of your body. So that's a very common deficiency we see. We see a shift in the zinc to copper ratio. So you get less, cop less zinc, um, which is very important for our immune system to function properly, more copper. So that's something that, that you can see. But again, in general, these are things that it could be different for every person. And, you know, I'll say this on blue in the face. Uh, in these situations where you have very serious conditions, it's always best to test and supplement according to the test. Uh, do you have a supplement recommendation for GERD? Well, it depends on what's causing the GERD. So in general, um, what I'll tell people to do instead of like PPIs and stuff like that, eighth of a teaspoon of sodium bicarbonate. This is also good for um, people who have uh, inflammation. There's a small study showing that uh, some sodium bicarbonate actually decreased inflammation or inflammatory cells in the spleen, which is a good thing if you're inflamed. Um, certain things like actually most acid reflux is not caused by too much stomach acid. It's caused by too little stomach acid. So actually people taking HCL, if they haven't had a stomach ulcer, can actually improve their symptoms. HCL is hydrochloric acid. Um, most GERD is caused by over distension of the stomach. Like literally you have a little valve that sits here and that valve prevents backflow. And so when there's too much pressure in the stomach, that valve gets leaky. So what we eat matters. So uh, eating a lot of processed food, a lot of junk food, a lot of carbohydrates that can create more pressure eating and then being sedentary. Most Americans do not move enough. 8,000 steps a day is the goal right? That decreases your risk of death from about 50 to 65% from all causes, depending on your age. That's a massive number. That should have got you to jump out of your seat. Like literally, I'm standing right now, actually, um, because of that. But those are the main things. The best thing that you can do for GERD is eat smaller meals, because that's going to help with that stomach distension. It's move after you eat. It's, it's meditate and do um, rest so you don't feel as um, uh, stressed because that does it. It's getting good sleep. Um, there's some evidence that sleeping on your left side actually helps with acid reflux because you clear the stomach acid faster than if you sleep on your right side. That was a new study that was published a couple of weeks ago. Um, and then sometimes I'll tell people start with something simple like, you know, bone broth or uh, a, a good probiotic. Uh, one of my favorite is seed, S-E-E-D. It's a symbiotic. It has good beneficial fiber and it has a clinically studied and validated probiotic species. But that, that's kind of where to start. Now, now, GERD can be caused by a lot of different reasons. Um, so it's really finding out what's the root cause of the GERD. But in general, it's increased intra-abdominal pressure. If you're overweight, if you have a lot of central belly fat, that causes a compressive effect. So it's addressing those root causes. Okay, thank you. Uh, is there a connection between, between gastroparesis and sarcoidosis? And what, what would you recommend? So gastroparesis typically can happen in any type of um, um, neuroinflammatory type of disorder. We typically see it with uh, diabetes, right? Because uh, when the blood sugars are elevated, it can cause damage to the nerves. But any type of nervous uh, system disorder can cause gastroparesis. And so it's really, really hard to treat, you know, medication is not very effective. I find like biofeedback. Um, so I have a whole thought process on healing nerves. This is not like very well clinically validated, but I've put a lot of people on this program and it's worked. Things like infrared sauna, things like PEMF, pulse electric magnetic fields or cellular exercise. 
there are animal studies showing that these things can help regrow nerves. Increasing BDNF, uh, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, to growth factor for nerves. And that is, um, can be done through exercise, through meditation, through sunlight, through human connection. So there, there are ways that you can try to reprime the nervous system. I highly recommend if you have any nervous system issues, you see a specialist, a functional neurologist. Functional neurologist. These are people who know techniques and, and ways to help heal the nervous system from within. Uh, I was prescribed 50,000 micrograms vitamin D twice a month for my kidney doctor. How can I get off of vitamin D? I have stage three kidney, kidney disease. Um, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but you probably can't. And the reason for that is, well, number one, if you're getting adequate sunlight, if you're not getting adequate sunlight, do that first. Sunlight is very important to synthesizing vitamin D. Then you can add food in like mushrooms and um, fatty fish. Those are, or those are oral sources of vitamin D, although um, vitamin D orally is not, or from food sources is not very high. Uh, most of it we get from sun exposure. So, you know, depending on your skin tone, to, uh, uh, between five to, to up to 30 minutes of sunlight a day is necessary to synthesize the vitamin D. But the reason I say that because of the, the kidney diseases, like I mentioned earlier, your kidneys are the final activation point for vitamin D. So if the kidneys are damaged, that means that that enzyme that activates the vitamin D is probably also deficient. So it's going to be hard for the body to activate that vitamin D, which is why a lot of people with uh, chronic kidney disease end up with low vitamin D levels. Uh, is there a minimum, minimum daily intake for turmeric for its anti-inflammatory properties? Um, that's a very good question. And the answer is no. So turmeric is one of those things because of its multiple mechanisms of action, the doses that some people need, it can be all over the place. So you, you'll see um, extract as high as like six grams in, in clinical studies for short-term use, like a, a week to two weeks of use. Um, most often the dose is around 1.5 grams and divided doses. That's been used for up to like three months in clinical studies. Now, if you look at a lot of the products that like the product that I use, um, I believe it has... 400 milligrams of turmeric in it, but it has other things that work on synergistic um, pathways as well. So, you know, that's kind of what you'll see in the, um, in the studies. It, it just kind of depends on um, uh, why you're using it, how you're using it. Are you using it for acute care or are you using it as, as kind of a, a maintenance type of thing? Uh, how about a supplement for anxiety? Um, so the the best thing, and you know, I know this is a supplement discussion. I'm giving you a whole lot of non-supplement advice, but that's like I said at the beginning, the supplements are a supplement. All anxiety stems from the fact that we try to control things that we can't control. That's the whole root cause of anxiety, right? We try to control things we can't control. So what I tell people is the space between stimulus and response is the space that we own, and that's the space for growth. That's where you latch on to. So um, that's number one. It's the mental work. So mindfulness, uh, non-sleep, non deep rest, um, cognitive behavioral therapy. Those are by far and away the most effective things for anxiety. You have to change your thoughts. If you want more positive thoughts, think more positive thoughts. Remove the word can't from your vocabulary. Right. And these things will start to benefit, you know, uh, exercise is very powerful for anxiety and depression, very powerful for mild anxiety, mild depression, All right? Probably better than, than medication for those for mild and, and moderate depression and anxiety. Um, supplement wise, magnesium is very important. Again, like I mentioned, stress depletes our magnesium. 
So magnesium is involved with a lot of the processes in the body that help deal with stress. Uh, CBD has been used for stress. Um, you can use the adaptogens. Ashwagandha is my favorite. I love ashwagandha. Adaptogens help the body deal with physiological and mental stress. They help the processes that underlie stress. Uh, other ones include holy basil, ginger, ginseng. Um, you can also use a cold therapy. So 11 minutes of cold therapy a week is actually increases our resilience. What I mean by resilience is exposing your body to small doses of stressors actually makes your body more resilient to stress. It improves your body's ability to deal with stress. That's one of the main benefits of exercise. It's one of the main benefits of fasting, things like that help our, they're, they're good stressors for our body. So when we encounter actually non-planned stress, we are better able to deal with it. Uh, we're almost finished. Uh, you know, uh, the clock's almost uh, nine. Uh, is OFEF a good drug to take for sarcoidosis patients given its side effects? What was that? Is OFEV, O-F-E-V, a good drug to take for sarcoidosis patients given its side effects? You know, I, I, I don't really want to comment on, on medications because there's a, there's a time and a place for meds. And I, I don't want to give you information that's going to dissuade you from taking a medication that may help you. Because here's the thing with sarcoidosis, we don't have a lot of research on these types of things, right? That is a specific class of medication that we use um, for like overactive um, immune systems for, for uh, pulmonary fibrosis. Um, that, so I don't want to tell you something and say, uh, you know, you shouldn't take that because it may benefit you. That's a question that if you're unsure, really talk it out with your physician and ask them why they're prescribing you that medication and why they think that medication can help you. Okay, thank you. Last question. Are there any supplements that you would definitely stay away from and why? Oh, there's a ton of them. Uh, <laughs> um, I think the, the number one thing I see people do is they use some of these quote unquote immune boosters incorrectly. And uh, I have a whole podcast on this. So you, especially if you have autoimmune disease, you don't want your immune system boosted. Autoimmune disease is your immune system's boosted. It's just attacking itself. So you have to be careful with things like echinacea, things like elderberry, things like astrologus. These are all things you'll see in quote unquote immune boost products. And they actually do. They cause your immune system to work better. And that's great when you're sick. Right. And by work better, I mean, it causes them to um, upregulate their immune fighting responsibilities. That's great when you're sick. It's not so good when you have autoimmune disease. So I would stay away from anything that is what we call an immunostimulant that stimulates the immune system to go and be more active. Immunoregulators are OK, like turmeric. That's an immunoregulator. Right, resveratrol, broccoli seed extract, sulfurane, uh, hops. Those are all immunoregulators. So that's typically what I. That's what I'd recommend if you have autoimmune disease to be careful with. Dr. Harris, thank you very much. We're at the top of the hour. I think this has been very. It was great information. I think we're going to all have to go back and review the tape because there's so much information. I can't take notes that fast. But thank you very much, everyone, for attending. Uh, we do have webinars and speakers every month. Uh, please check our website, lifeandbreath.org. And uh, hoping everybody has a good night. Stay warm and stay safe. We'll see you next month. God bless.